Okay, we're going to get started. My name is Bill Durgan. I'm the provost here at SUNY IT, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you today. Um, in particular, the Stop ACES Committee. Thank you. Um, we're expecting Tony Pacente, the county executive, to be here momentarily, so we'll welcome him when he arrives. But mostly to the students, those inductees who are, have been in, or will soon be inducted into uh, Psy Chi. So congratulations to all the students. We're, we're delighted to have you all here today. Um, there's been a lot of change here at SUNY IT um, recently, and a lot going on. And of course, you've all probably noted the giant construction project on our campus. You probably all have heard of the uh, pending merger with the CNSE, the uh, College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering. And in all of that, I don't want to let the good work of our faculty and students get lost. And so I'm just delighted um, to uh, take this occasion to remember all those, all those good works that are done by our faculty and students in other areas. And I think this is a, the, um, the ACES area is a terrific example of the good things that our faculty members are doing here on campus. It's just terrific. Um, I've been very impressed with, this, with the uh, Stop ACES project. Um, I was at the lecture last year, if I remember correctly. Uh, most impressive undertaking, uh, really good work being done. Um, it's just um, a terrific thing for for this institution, for our faculty, and for our students. My job here today is very simple. It's to introduce Professor Paul Schulman, um, the past um, chair of the department. And um, he is actually going to induct um, the members of Psych High, and then turn the meeting over to Joanne Joseph, who will introduce the speaker. So we'll move along here very quickly. But Paul, the podium is now yours. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, uh, and welcome to the 30th annual Psy Chi Lecture at SUNY IT. Um, I'm, my name is Paul Schulman. I'm the advisor to Psy Chi, which is the National Honor Society in Psychology. Uh, each year, outstanding students here at SUNY IT are inducted into Psy Chi, and to celebrate their achievements, our chapter invites a prominent researcher to campus to discuss his or her research, and this year we're honored and pleased to have David Retu as our speaker. Uh, I'm always struck by the grammatical voice of, of, uh, of some terms relating to education. We say that a college or university confers a degree upon a student, and the construction is always passive, at least from the student's point of view. You can receive a degree, but you can't receive an education. You can't just sit in, your, sit in your seat in the back row of the lecture hall and have that education, oh, that's nice, uh, and have that education conferred upon you. You don't absorb an education. You don't soak it up. Uh, you get an education. The construction is always active. It's hard work. Uh, and this active voice especially characterizes our students at SUNY IT and especially those at, in Psy Chi. Uh, all of the students at this campus work hard, in Psy Chi or not in Psy Chi. Virtually all of them work off campus to support themselves. Many have families, and many have crushing demands on their time and on their finances. If our students have excelled, as those just inducted into Psy Chi have, it's not because their life circumstances have set them on a glide path to success. It's not because they're intellectually absorbent, and it, it is because they're active and they've struggled to excel, it's because they've worked hard. We honor the students who have been accepted to Psy Chi this morning, because uh, we actually did it this morning, uh, and, and we should recognize uh, all of our students for the hard work that they've done, uh, for the difficulties they face, and for the obstacles they've overcome in just being here. So I think our students are very, very admirable, and especially those in Psy Chi. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to in I'd like the new inductees of Psy Chi to stand up as I call their names if they're here. Um, uh, Rachel Barbado. <laughs> Jessica Zdanowitz, but she's at work. Um, Scott Menin. <laughs> Elaine Vong. 
I think she's at work too. Um, uh, David Franklin. Amanda Vasali. I guess she's not here. Uh, Alyssa DeFrank. Natalie DeFayette. Ah. <laughs> Don't applaud yourself. Um, Kendra Wagstaff and Francesca Palladino. Um, and, and there are some students who were previously inducted, uh, and I'd like to mention their names. Carrie Burnett, uh, Cassandra Bicking. Oh, yes, please stand up, Carrie. Cassandra Bicking. Kim Erla. Shannon Daly. <laughs> um, uh, Shelby Quinn and Melanie Johnson, who are not here. So I'd like to congratulate all of you. So this is the 30th year of our chapter of Sci Chi and of this lecture series. And the person who founded our chapter, who organized this lecture series and introduced every speaker for 18 years, was Bridge Mullock. <clears throat> and I'd like to just recognize the extraordinary service he performed for our students, for the psychology program, and for our school. Uh, Bridge was immersed in the governance and community life of this institution. He was a gifted and demanding teacher who won the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching, but more than anything, he was a genius at friendship. Uh, at restaurants, he would introduce himself to the chef, uh, and they would, they, wouldn't, they would not want him to pay. Um, cab drivers would really refuse to charge him because he would talk to them in their native language, and he knew dozens, or he seemed to know dozens, uh, regardless of what language it was. Uh, he was interested in everybody's story, and this lecture series and our chapter of Sci Chi uh, would not exist were it not for his efforts. So these lectures are co-sponsored by the Social and Behavioral Sciences Department, chaired by Dr. Veronica Titchener, by the Stop ACEs Committee, and by Dr. William Durgan, Provost of SUNY IT. And I'd like to thank them all for their generous support. And with that, I'll introduce Joanne Joseph. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to also welcome you all to this 30th anniversary and 30th lecture of, of Sci Chi. And I'd like to first tell you a little bit about what the Stop ACES Committee is, for those of you not familiar with it. Um, Stop ACES, ACES refers to adverse childhood um, experiences. And the ACE project in this county emanated from the work from CDC, uh, Drs. Valetti and Anda. And their work illustrated and indicated that there is a connection between these early childhood adverse experiences and both mental and physical health. But most importantly, they focused on, on the physical health. We always knew that there was a mental health implication, but to show that this also impacts physical health and health care costs is quite significant. And so, as a result, a group of individuals in this community and organizations decided to get together some eight years ago. We work slowly, what can I tell you? Because <laughs> we have a zero budget. <laughs> but um, we've worked collaboratively together to formulate a plan to address these issues in our, in our county. And one initiative that we've taken is to focus on positive parenting. Because parenting is the antidote to a number of these adverse childhood experiences. Part of positive parenting is understanding and appreciating individual differences in children. And most specifically, understanding the difference 
between what might be natural temperament differences and psychopathology. Hence, we invited Dr. Ritu uh, to join us today. I don't see t um, Tony Pacenti yet. Is he here? Not yet? Well, then I'm just going to go ahead and introduce you. And when he comes in, he's been a major, major supporter of our efforts here in the, the community. And I wanted to honor him today. And I knew he wants to uh, address this group as, as well. OK, what about our speaker? Dr. Ritu is an associate professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the University of Vermont College of Medicine. He is the training director of UVM's Child and Adolescent um, Psychiatry Fellowship and the director of Pediatric Psychiatry Clinic at Fletcher's Allen Health Center. He received his undergraduate degree in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania before working at the National Institute of Mental Health. He received his medical degree at, at the University of Vermont and then did both his adult and child psychiatry training at Harvard Medical School within Massachusetts General and McLean Hospital Program. He joined the UVC faculty in 2002 where he divides his time between clinical teaching and research activities. His main research interest is in the role of temperament and personality factors in childhood psychiatric disorders. Dr. Ratu has over a hundred, a hundred, um, published journal articles, chapters, and scientific abstracts on a variety of child mental health topics, including a recent book entitled Child Temperament, New Thinking About the Boundary Between Traits and Illness and that's published by W.W. W. Norton. And um, Dr. Ritu does have copies of his book available today at a discount, I might add, and, and, and they will be available to him, um, but to you for purchase at, not to you, but to, to you uh, for purchase at the end of his talk. And I do see that Mr. Pacenti is here, and we, we just said nice things about you. <laughs> But you missed it, so I'm not saying it again. <laughs> so will you please welcome Dr. Uh, Mr. Pacenti first, and then we'll come back up here. I am not a doctor. Good, good afternoon. It is really my pleasure to be here, and I'm sorry if I, I jumped in a little late. It's a board day in county government. That's when the legislators meet, and it's always a busy, crazy day, and so I apologize for jumping in at this point. Uh, but I did want to come and, and welcome you and say how uh, very pleased and, and uh, proud I am and, and uh, to thank you for your continued involvement and work, and I'd like to thank Dr. Joseph for her continued uh, commitment to stop bases and, and the work that's been done here and continues to get done each and every day. Um, county government obviously plays a large role in a variety of human services uh, aspects. And for us to understand, uh, like you and like all of the providers of uh, the multiple agencies that, that are here today and the uh, the practitioners, uh, all of you that uh, are involved on a day-to-day -day basis in looking at and, and studying uh, and determining, you know, causes of um, adverse childhood experiences and, uh, you know, all the work in, in terms of uh, preventative uh, issues. Uh, I, I thank you for your continued involvement in this. It is so important for us uh, as a community, as a county, as a government, obviously, to understand and to look at ways in which uh, we can improve, uh, we can deal with uh, issues of, uh, of mental distress or illness, uh, all areas of abuse that, that our children go through are very, you know, important for us to understand and to deal with. So, uh, you know, for the last uh, several years, and I believe it's almost eight years that this committee has been in effect, 
to look at uh, at these at these various areas uh, and conditions and causes. Uh, it's really important for us. It's important as we put forth an agenda and a policy of, of trying to deal with all of our young people and all of the, this community in, in these areas. So um, my message today is really simple, to thank you, uh, to welcome you to this, uh, uh, to this uh, workshop, if you will, today, and, and to continue the work that you've been doing, that all of you and all the various agencies that come together and look at, uh, look at this uh, and uh, try to deal with all of these, uh, all of these issues. It really is uh, at the forefront of my concern as county executive that we continually try to understand and look at ways in which we can pr improve the delivery of services, but and by doing so understand what those causes are and how we can get get better acquainted, but also serve uh, the our, our children, our families, our community better. So um, again, I, I think you, you have really, over the last several years, uh, worked uh, tremendously and, and have, have really you know, helped us in, in doing our job better on the county level, but also working uh, you know, through, through your agencies to do the same. So I want to again thank you. I want to thank Dr. Joseph for her leadership in this and so many other aspects of, uh, of community uh, health and, and wellness that she has been a part of over the, over the years and, and her continued involvement. We were just together last week at the uh, Center for Family Life and Recovery uh, because April is uh, Awareness Month uh, in, in areas of uh, substance abuse and alcohol abuse and that's an important aspect that does obviously come into play when you look at the adverse childhood experiences. I mean, alcohol plays a role, drug abuse plays a role, all of these areas. So, um, you know, we need to better understand that. Our work in the health department, and we're joined, the Phyllis Ellis, the director of health, is joined here today as well, as we look at areas of, uh, of public health and, and how those impacts, or how certain areas impact mental health. I always stress that we can't have a discussion about public health in this community without making sure that mental health is a component and, and is right there with it. Um, the work in the lead program, um, you know, while people look at lead prevention as uh, uh, an area of importance in terms of illness, it is significantly important in areas of, men of mental health and studies have shown that there is an impact there. So we continue to look at different ways in our, in our health department and through our, through our agencies to combat this um, and uh, to work together with all of you. And so today, again, thank you. Continue the good work. And I look forward uh, to hearing uh, more about what has come as a result of this and how we can better serve the people of Oneida County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. So hello everybody, is the sound okay? Too much? It sounds like it might be a little too much. Uh, and oh, just, I didn't even have to ask. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, I really appreciate all of you taking your, uh, some time out of your day. I'm gonna do my very best to uh, make it feel to you as though your time was well spent. Uh, I'm very grateful to Dr. Joseph, to Psychi, to Stop Aces for inviting me. It's been wonderful to be part of this tradition, which I, I didn't know existed, and, and I'm really thrilled to be part of. Um, you, you heard a little bit about what I do. I just uh, put that out there. Like many of us, we do 12 different things, right? So I, I uh, see patients. I do research in this area that I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, I teach medical students and residents. And uh, I also do a couple other a couple other things. I, I actually maintain a couple blogs. One is part of my job, in fact. This one through the university is, is uh, dedicated more for primary care physicians. Um, the other one is more for the, the general public. And if you're interested in some of these topics, I invite you to uh, explore this a little bit more. I'm also trying something a little bit different today. I, it's funny how education kind of 
comes full circle, and I'm old enough that I started on note cards. And then PowerPoint came, and like a lot of people, I really got into PowerPoint. And I used to give this talk and have maybe about 100 slides. And now I'm, I'm paring that down. So we've just got about 20 slides. Um, so I, and I'm just trying to present the things that I think give you a good visual content and leaving the text out. So let me know how that works. Uh, we're always trying to improve and, and improve our teaching style. What I'm going to talk about today, I, we'll divide this up into three parts. The first part will be a very quick overview of uh, temperament and personality, just to kind of bring, bring people up to speed a little bit. We'll then sort of get into the meat of the issue of, of how do you draw the line? How do we understand this link between personality or temperament traits and psychiatric disorders? Um, we can stop there, maybe take a question or two, and then get into you know, what I think may be the most important part is, well, that's really interesting, but so what? You know, how does this apply in our day-to-day -day thinking as parents, as educators, and as clinicians? Uh, just in terms of disclosures, I receive no money from the pharmaceutical industry, so you can trust everything that I have to tell you. <laughs> um, but as uh, Dr. Joseph did mention, I am uh, trying to promote uh, this book, and uh, some of the topics I'll be talking today are directly in, in that book, and I just want that to be up front. All right, so this is a topic, this, in, this, this boundary, this fuzzy area between psychopathology and uh, traits has been something that I've, I've been interested in for a very long time. It just seems like lately a lot of other people are interested in this too, and which is great. I'm really happy to see that. I think that probably has to do with a few factors. One is that there's been a lot of research, and you may have either read these original articles or seen them covered on news outlets that are basically saying that the rate of X is going up when it comes to different psychiatric disorders. The rate of ADHD is going up. The rate of autism is going up. The rate of anxiety disorders are going up. So we're getting all of this information that, that the prevalence of mental illness is rising. And that's, for some people, been a source of alarm um, and has provoked some criticism that, that maybe we are going too far and that maybe we're starting to over-pathologize everything and that the day-to-day -day struggles in life are now being labeled as a mental illness. Uh, I think a lot of that is being driven from the concern that we're using too many medications as well. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, someone has ADHD. It's another thing to say, well, and therefore you're going to have this medicine. That's really all we're going to do. So I think that's really fueling a lot of this, this interest. And then the other big thing that happened was the, the book that contains all of the definitions, the official definitions of psychiatric illness, just had their latest edition after 20 years. DSM-5, and in it, they, uh, some of the things stayed pretty much the same, but a lot of things changed, and a lot of things became more inclusive. So now it's slightly easier to get a diagnosis of ADHD than it used to be. And that, again, provoked some of this, this discussion and this alarm. Finally, I think uh, the other thing that has been I think people are getting frustrated with, I know I'm frustrated with this, people in the field are frustrated, people outside of the field are a bit frustrated, is in this, this era of, of technology and being able to have these unbelievable technological tools at our disposal with neuroimaging, with these gene chips that, can, that with one chip can put two million uh, genetic variations on one chip. Despite all this amazing technology, we still really struggle being able to say psychopathology is that you know, to point on a, a brain skin and say, there it is. And that, to a lot of people, is unsettling. And uh, I think for some people, is provoking sort of an understandable skepticism about whether these things are real. And I, and I want to get at that question of what, what do we really mean when we say something is real or unreal? And we'll get to that a, a little bit later in the talk. OK, so let's start with the definition. Uh, what is temperament? What is personality? I think you all know it. Um, you can define it as, as kind of your, your typical, the, the way an individual typically responds to the environment, to other people. Um, one, one analogy that I like, uh, if any of you have any kind of musical training, uh, one metaphor that works for me, and I tend to use a lot of metaphors, so forgive me, but if you think of a, a person's life as a musical piece, a symphony, concerta, a song, then temperament is the key that that music is in. 
And while there's no, you know, it's un, you're not limited at all by what that piece of music needs to sound like, you can hear the difference between a piece of music that's in F major versus in A minor. And maybe the key will change for a while, but then usually it comes back. Uh, temperament is certainly a strong component of people, but it's been studied in anything from primates to dogs. In fact, dogs are bred in part because of their temperamental traits. Uh, but even beyond that, there's an amazing literature on the temperament of guppies, actually. So it, it does pervade many different animal species. Uh, there's, there's questions about why, why are we different? You know, what, what's the evolutionary advantage for, for people being different? And that could be a whole nother talk. Uh, there may be an advantage for a group not to be exactly the same because then if, you know, something bad happens, it knocks everybody in the group down. Or it may be that in certain environments, uh, certain temperaments can thrive more than others and it's good to be able to stack the deck and have kind of a wide variability. Uh, one of the great guppy experiments, for example, showed that when you had a very low stress, not a lot of predators, a lot of food available, those extroverted guppies did really well. They had a, they, they had a high rate of, of mating success. But as soon as you uh, threw in some bass into the, uh, into the tank, those bold guppies ended up getting eaten because they were just a little bit too bold. And the more inhibited guppies, the shy guppies, actually had a better survival rate. So there may be some advantages uh, for people to be different. And, and one of the messages that I want to send is that we need to celebrate those differences and we need to cherish children for being different while at the same time trying to find some areas where we can help them with the rough spots. Now the idea of temperament has been around for a long, long time. Uh, there is a, a, a well-known Greek philosopher, Galen, who proposed that there were different temperamental types and your, uh, your type was determined by your concentration of various humors in your blood. You know, phlegm and bile and, and, uh, and it sounds very outlandish except sometimes I point out if you substituted, you know, blood, phlegm, bile for serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine, we, things have not changed that, that much. Um, for a lot of people, especially for the, the psychiatry students, people associate temperament with two names, Jess and Thomas. Uh, both of them were uh, child psychiatrists. Uh, they did a lot of their work in the 50s and 60s and 70s. They were analytically trained. That means they were sort of trained in kind of the Freudian uh, school of thought. And they, uh, through their work, through this observational study that they did of uh, a series of kids, they began to postulate that there were these innate traits that children came into the environment with. And these were the, these were the nine traits that you can see up here. And uh, they postulated that um, none of these traits were good and bad all by themselves, but that what either helped with ad adaptation or not was how well those, those traits fit with a particular environment. And that environment might be the traits of a parent, it might be the environment of the school. And that was the, the classic uh, goodness of fit theory, which is a cornerstone of, of developmental psychology. Now, when we think about that, uh, and if you, look at the, if you look at the names, I mean, you can see that we're in trouble right from the start with this boundary issue between uh, psychopathology and traits, right? Because we've, we've got a trait called activity level, and we have a disorder called hyperactivity. We have a trait called mood, and we have a disorder called depression. So just in the way that things are labeled, you can, you can see that this is going to be a problem, a challenge that we're going to have to tackle pretty, on, pretty early on. And Thomas and Chess, in addition to postulating these nine dimensions, also theorized that there were these three types, so that there were these predictable ways that these traits kind of fit together in populations of kids. And the most famous categorization was the, 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 the difficult child. And we probably still hear that, we use that term all the time. Thomas and Chess meant it as a combination of kids who were a bit low in uh, adaptability, kind of low in mood, high in activity, and that was uh, postulated to be you know, a small percentage of all, all the kids. Now when we talk about this, Thomas and Chess, to me, when I learned it, and uh, to a lot of people now, does not seem particularly uh, controversial. But at the time, they took quite a bit of heat for their ideas. Um, partially because at the time the two prevailing schools of thought back in the 1960s were the, the analysts, so the people more uh, trained with Freudian principles, and they didn't like the idea that there could be these sort of more biologically driven innate factors, 
And then there, there were the behaviorists who, who believed that everything was about learning principles and that kids were born as, uh, as a blank slate, uh, is the analogy people use. They weren't too thrilled with this either. So it was a, it was a bold theory at the time, even though now it, it seems like it's, it's not particularly that big of a deal. So a lot of people think that that was the end of temperament, and I think in a lot of introductory um, textbooks, what you learn about temperament is still Thomas and Chess, but there has been an incredible amount of research in the last 50 years that have looked at personality and temperament. That doesn't mean that there's consensus, and people still argue about what the core dimensions are, um, and how they relate to each other, and that's one of the real uh, difficulties in our field, is that if you're, you're a big temperament researcher, then you basically come up with your own scheme, you, you, call, uh, you call things a certain way, you develop a questionnaire to measure them in your way, and you're not really sure how well that relates to the other guy's scheme. Because uh, they have a dimension that sort of sounds the same and sort of sounds different. So it's a, it is a bit of a mess out there. But there is consensus that, I, I would say, at least these three big domains. So one of the domains has to do with how easily a person is brought to experience negative emotions. How quickly does somebody, is someone brought to be angry or anxious um, or sad? You know, what, what's the amplitude of that response when you get it? How long will it last? And that's called negative affectivity or negative emotionality, or neuroticism. Then there's sort of the flip side of that, how well somebody can be brought to experience positive emotions. How well someone, their baseline moves is positive, they like a lot of stimulus around them, they don't mind being the center of attention, uh, they're social, they're gregarious. That, that term has been called extroversion, it's been called surgency, uh, there's novelty seeking, similar constructs, not exactly the same, but similar. And then a third big dimension has to do with, with how well you can regulate those other two dimensions. In other words, how well can you, in terms of trying to achieve a goal, if you have an objective, how well can you kind of keep those other things in check to do sort of a planned volitional activity? How much can you control your emotions, control your attention, control your, your, uh, your behaviors? And that's a bit of a regulatory dimension. And just like there are traits and there are types, um, the literature, again, it's not, it's not uniform, but most studies kind of show that there's a relatively small number of, of categories of, of, of kids who have different uh, combinations. And I won't go through uh, you know, all the combinations, but you can sort of see how all of those fit together. And I, I, you know, I, I gave them slightly different names for the book. The, the moderate, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the scientists call the moderate group unremarkable, and I just thought that was a little derogatory. Like, hey, here's my unremarkable kid. Um, and it's actually probably the most common group, so I, I renamed that one the moderate group. Um, but you usually see a lot of, a lot of kids who have kind of average levels. Um, you see this confident group, which is low negative emotionality, high in the other two. An anxious group that really is, is known for, for high negative emotionality. An agitated group that has this this interesting and I think difficult combination of high novelty seeking and high negative affectivity. And then a mellow group that tends not to be particularly anxious but not particularly extroverted either. There's, and there's plenty of, now a, a lot of people are saying, now which group am I, which group are my kids in? And, and, and it's a very natural thing to do. And you may find that you don't fit any of those. And uh, Thomas and Chess, actually a lot of people don't know this, but they, uh, about a third of their kids didn't fit any of their categories as well. So these are not rigid categories, but I think it's helpful to think about them. Now how does temperament look? In the, oh, but before I get into that, let me just say a, a couple other things about temperament that I know people always tend to ask about. One is, here I'll get back for a second. One is about uh, sex differences, right? That's a very trendy thing to talk about. And when you look at it and you have a big enough sample, you generally do see uh, some sex differences. Um, from about adolescence on, negative emotionality often tends to be a little bit higher in, in females rather than males. Regulatory dimensions also sometimes are higher in, in females and in males. But the differences are actually smaller than a lot of people think and a lot, and a lot smaller than the stereotypes. Uh, there's also this literature about birth order that I think some people are interested in. And that too is, uh, a turns out when people have really studied it, is a little, seems to be a little bit more hype than, uh, than science. Uh, there are sometimes slight differences that come up, um, and I don't want to get too technical, but the problem is that uh, birth order is often confounded with 
family size. And that when you control for family size, a lot of the birth order differences go away. And then finally, how stable are, are temperament traits? You'll talk to some parents and they'll say, I know my kid was going to be really active before they were born. That's the way they, 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 they felt in the uterus. I knew they were going to be hyperactive and they just continued that way all along. And the studies show that yes, uh, temperament traits, personality traits really are pretty stable. Um, you can measure a trait at two time points and you almost always will get a statistically significant correlation between those two time points. But it's not you know, it's certainly not destiny, and there is a lot of room to move, especially for people who are kind of in between. So, you know, one message we do not want to be giving kids whenever we apply these labels is to sort of say, well, you're shy, you know, or, or I like better, you act shy now, you're going to act that way forever, because that's really not true at all. Uh, there is also some interesting research, I know this is a little, mainly adults in the room, that uh, stability gets, is increased after the age of 30. So for those of you who have a partner or a spouse over the age of 30, what you have is probably what you're going to get. <laughs> There's also this interesting phenomenon, because um, remember, temperament traits are not necessarily good or bad. And if you think about what comprises most of these traits, there are, there are qualities that are generally in our culture considered to be positive and qualities that are negative. So people who are really extroverted, they can be exciting, they can be... Uh, really social, they can be fun to have around, but they may not be the most punctual people. And may, they maybe kind of forget things sometimes. And there are people who can sometimes seem kind of anxious and reserved, but at the same time they can be the kindest, warmest people around. And there's this interesting phenomenon, I, I call it the yet phenomenon, that whenever we describe the ideal whatever, you know, the ideal spouse, the ideal partner, the ideal kid, we tend to put a butt right down the middle of those positive and negative qualities, right? Like, I'm looking for somebody who is exciting yet responsible, you know, who is, uh, you know, reserved but assertive. And, you know, present company excluded, of course. Now, those combinations may be hard to find. And when we're explaining and we're talking about temperament, we have to remember that most of us come prefix. And it's, we can't just kind of order a la carte and, and look at these, these components of temperament that, that naturally don't often fit together so well. Okay, so what about the brain and temperament? Now we gotta remember, I was saying this to the Psychi folks, it's great to talk about qualities and dimensions, but all of this has gotta, like, it has to apply to the brain, right? That's our organ, and we need to be able to understand it on the level of the brain. And there has actually been quite a bit of studies genetic studies, neuroimaging studies, and I just am showing one uh, that are up there that sort of gives you an idea about what, what temperament may look like. So what we have here, this is a, this is a functional MRI scan, and basically what it's looking, this is the, uh, an, a place in the brain called the amygdala. This is a place in the brain called the anterior cingulate gyrus. And the, um, the trait of uh, what they called harm avoidance, which is sort of like a tendency to become anxious and tired and fatigued, and upset could be explained by how much or how little these two areas talk to each other when activated. So people who tended to be less anxious, less harm avoidant, uh, when the amygdala fired, it talked to the cingulate gyrus and then there was a negative feedback loop back to the amygdala to regulate that response. For people who are higher in harm avoidance, these two areas operated more independently the amygdala would fire, you wouldn't get so much of a response in the cingulate gyrus, and, that, and the amygdala would, con would continue in a, a bit more of a dysregulated state. And that, that degree of connectivity between those two regions explained 30% of the variance in harm avoidance scores, which for those of you who, who don't do this stuff for a living, that, that's a lot. And this is the way that this can look. Uh, and I point out this not only just to show you what I think are these really cool studies, but you may have heard of the amygdala, right? Uh, people study the amygdala for other things. People study the amygdala for anxiety disorders. People study the amygdala when it comes to depressive disorders. And this is, I'll come back to this when we talk about whether or not this connection between traits and disorders goes beyond the level of, of, of just the behavior. Does it, does, it, does it extend to the brain? All right, what about genetics? So a lot of people sort of assume that temperament equals genetics, right? That's what you're born with. And if you want to see the genetic component of something, 
look at a really little infant, because that's, that's what you get. That's before all the environment can have its effect. And it turns out that most traits, uh, when you measure the heritability, and they do this through twin studies, uh, I won't get into all the, tech, uh, the technical aspects of it, but when you do twin studies, the genetic, the, the genetic influence of personality and temperament traits is about 50%. A little bit more for some, a little bit less for that. It varies from study to study. This was a study we did on uh, adolescents um, looking at the trait of neuroticism or negative affectivity. We found a, a heritability of about 60%. And especially for the students, a lot of people think, oh, th th this number, this heritability is sort of a static coefficient. And it's not, actually. The genetic influence can change. It can change based on the age that you're looking at. It can change uh, by whether you're looking at males and females. And it can change by culture. So, um, so these estimates are not sort of some fixed number that are there for your whole life. In fact, one thing that is counterintuitive to a lot of people is that the genetic influence of, of several traits, we, we did a study on extroversion that looked at this, the genetic influence of some traits gets higher the older you are. So that, that old adage that as you get older you become more like your mother, there may be some genetics behind some of that. The other thing I would point out about, about genetics is when we talk about, people also study the genetics of disorders. So I told you that the genetics of being prone to be anxious, a temperamental trait of harm avoidance may be about 50 or 60 percent. What do you think the heritability of most anxiety disorders are? About 50, 60 percent. So we're seeing this convergence on multiple levels between traits and disorders. We're seeing a convergence on the, on the genetic and the heritabilities. We're seeing a convergence in terms of the brain imaging. Now, you know, one of the, one of the great things about, again, for the psych high students, one of the great things about learning about the brain especially, or, or learning in general, is that just when you think you, you've got something down, you've figured it out, you go to the next level, and then somebody says, well, you know, and, you learn something as an undergrad and then you go to grad school and you, you, you say what you think. It's like, well, uh, there's a little bit more to that. And then you think, okay, now I got it. And then you go to the next level. And, well, there's a little bit more to that too. And, and when it comes to, to genetics and, and the environment, I think that this couldn't be more true. So for many years, we were stuck in this uh, kind of this nature versus nurture argument. And people, there's, and there's remnants of this now. I mean, I still had this discussion with a, a psychiatrist the other day who said, well, I don't think this problem is biological. And I said, I just don't know what that means anymore. I mean, I, I used to think I know what that meant, and I, I don't anymore. So the idea used to be that there were, there were genes or environment that were causing a certain behavior. And that was with us for, for too long. Um, and then we got to this idea that it wasn't versus, it was an and. So behaviors could be, you know, they could be 50-50, but the, but the kind of the implication behind the and was even though that they are 50-50, there are um, there's separate paths, right? There's the genetic path, and then there's the environment path, and they, do, and they don't really intermingle, that they're separate pathways. And the where we are now, and I think mercifully, is that we really are understanding that this is a completely two-way street, and that the way that, that genetics and the environment change each other in ways that are very important and I think really, really interesting. And there is some great literature out there right now that are showing that the environment can actually change gene expression. You can't really change your DNA code, but you can change which genes get expressed. And certain bad things, you know, certain childhood adverse events, that can actually change your genetic expression. And likewise, your genetic tendency your, your genes can actually determine which environments you are going to be exposed to. That the environment is not some random thing that comes, that, that is sort of played upon your genes. It actually may determine which, which kind of environment you're going to get. And this is not just an academic, this is, I mean, I think we really need to use this information because it's so important with how we understand how kids and families can either be thriving or, or, and how they can get into trouble. And I, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, when it comes to anxiety. So uh, hopefully some of you are old enough. Do you remember the, um, the old movie with Steve Martin, Parenthood? 
Anyone remember that movie? So he has this horrible vision. He's, he's putting his son into play second base, and he's anxious. He doesn't want it, and he's sure that he's going to turn his kid into a psychopathic killer because he's pushing. And then there's a scene where this poor kid is standing on the roof with a machine gun, and this is all of his worst. You know, this is a dream that he has. So let me give you an example of how these things can be working together. So let's, and I'll use baseball because that, that was the example from the movie. So let's start with, you know, a kid who has an anxious temperament and who's about to play in a big baseball game and who's becoming more anxious about playing in the baseball game and then gets put to be in second base. So what happens when this child is at second base? Well, then all the negative thoughts start to come. Those anxious temperament can, can cause some of these anxious thoughts. Please don't throw me the ball. Please don't hit it to me. I'm going to drop it. Everyone's going to hate me. And what do those thoughts do? They make somebody even more anxious. And then, God forbid, what happens? The ball does come to this child. He's now anxious. His hand is shaking. You, and there's actually a stronger likelihood now that he actually will drop the ball. He drops the ball. He becomes very upset. You have a, 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 mom in, a mom and dad in the stands watching this. There's nothing worse than watching your kid completely crash in a, in a situation like that. And, you know, maybe the parents have some of the same genes, and maybe they're slightly anxious, too. So you, the parents do what any, you know, loving parent would do. You try to protect your kid from bad things happening, and you say, this isn't worth it. We're going to stop playing baseball. Uh, I just don't want to see, I don't want to set my kid up for this. And so the kid stops playing baseball, at least in this context. And then what happens? He doesn't get to develop those skills. He, he lives with the idea that he's really bad at something. And one of the things that we know about anxiety is it only gets better in the, in the situation that you're, that you're trying to overcome. It's not like a broken car where you go fix it and then go back into the situation. You actually have to be in the situation feeling uncomfortable to be able to overmaster it. So this child then avoids things and becomes more anxious and more off to the races. So when, when that child shows up maybe in my office because of really severe anxiety, and the parents say, is this genetic? I say, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is how I think it works. It's genes, and I say yes, basically, because I think it's genes and environment. That's the background section. Uh, let me plunge into a little bit more about getting right into the, the heart of the issue about uh, psychopathology and temperament. So uh, just a real brief history, and uh, I'm by no means a Freud expert, but just to give you a real brief overview. Um, you know, back when, when Freud and Freud's ideas were dominant, one of the things he postulated were the forces that caused someone to be mentally ill were exactly the same forces that cause people to have particular traits, right? So he really saw this strong link between the causes of everyday traits and the causes of, of symptoms and disorders. And then in the 1900s, psychologists kind of went into their own department and psychiatry went into their department. And there was a long period of time where there wasn't a lot of overlap. Um, the psychologists were studying traits. And, um, and the psychiatrists were still uh, studying a lot of the Freudian principles, and they were separate. And one of the amazing things that Thomas and Chess did was it sort of forced those together again. And that could have been the, the, the uh, sort of a dawn of a new era, but then we kind of un got into this era of, of psychopharmacology and the decade of the brain, which, which was a great thing and, and a very important thing, but in an effort, I think, on by our field in psychiatry to legitimize ourselves, to say we are real doctors, we study real traits, there, and, and now that the pharmaceutical companies had drugs that could treat these different things, there was this push to sort of see psychiatric illness as something that had nothing to do with your traits. Um, you know, a, a depression would come out of the blue, panic attacks would come out of nowhere, you got these things just like you got the flu. Had to do with genes or we didn't know, but it really didn't have anything to do with your own with your own traits or, or personality dimensions. And now we've entered this time where, th and there are certainly a lot of people where that's true. Uh, I don't want to deny that at all. But then the literature started to accumulate saying, well, that's not really quite right. And I think that there is a lot of overlap between these, t these uh, different domains. And now that concept, I would argue, is not even controversial anymore, and we're now studying how they're related and um, getting to more depth about that. And one of the things that have really helped us 
to sort of acknowledge this link is that even though our DSM system treats psychiatric illness as a binary condition, you have it or you don't, you know, it's kind of like cancer, there's not, there's not a lot of in between. When people study, study uh, psychiatric symptoms using quantitative measures, what you find is this kind of, um, this bell-shaped curve, this normally distributed curve. You don't see like a whole bunch of people here and then another hump way out here where you can say, ah, there, those are the people who have ADHD. You see this very smooth, uh, you know, con continuous distribution. So this makes it difficult then. I mean, so then this is, this is really what we're talking about. Then how do you draw the line? So you might kind of draw the line here. But one of the things that we've been, but, but based on what, right? I mean, why, why is it there? In some ways, I, I think diagnosing things like ADHD are a bit like diagnosing somebody as being tall. You know, it, and it's that sort of challenging because there's this bit of an arbitrary nature in making this separation. I mean, we can all agree about the people who are way out here, and we can all agree about the people who are here but these are the folks where there's a lot of disagreement. And those, there's a lot of folks out there, right? They're, they're have, they have to be out there. And what's been happening over time, and you can argue whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, is the line has come down. It, and it has. And it's come down for, it, and this is not just ADHD where this exists. This is true for autism. This is true for autistic traits. This is true for generalized anxiety traits. It's true for generalized mood. The threshold for what we are calling a psychiatric disorder has been dropping, you know, pretty precipitously over, for, over the last 40, 50 years. And you can argue that that's a good thing or it's a bad thing. It's probably a little bit of both, uh, but it certainly has. And this is probably one of the driving forces for what other people consider to be this epidemic in psychiatric illness. Now, is it a bad thing? A lot of people, if you go into some of these blogs, a lot of people think this really is a very bad thing. And uh, I personally, I'm, I mean, I'm open to discussions about this. I'm not so sure. I mean, certainly if diagnosis means just using medicines, I think that is a very legitimate concern. But I do wonder whether it's really, is it really, do we really have to reserve the top 1% of people as being labeled having a psychiatric illness? What if we all qualified for uh, having a, a psychiatric illness? Is that really so bad? I mean, if you think about it, other fields, I, I'm not going to ask anybody to, you know, HIPAA violations and, and confidentiality, but if I asked how many of you in this room ever had an orthopedic diagnosis in your whole life, I'd probably get a lot of hands raised. How many people have ever been called, had been diagnosed with a pulmonary condition? Probably a lot of people, right? That doesn't mean that those fields are completely out of whack. It just means that we have, you know, more severe illnesses and we have less severe illnesses. So I, I wonder about that, and I wonder whether in a very well-meaning way to reduce stigma, we're actually adding to stigma by reserving that category for those really sick people out there. So something to think about, and I'd be interested to get your feedback on that. I just got a quick drink here. I'm not used to talking this much. I'm temperamentally a pretty quiet guy. So in my own training then, you know, how do we draw the line? So when I was in doing my psychiatry training, it was taught to me to be pretty simple. In fact, there was one word that distinguished between a trait and a disorder. And that word was impairment, right? So if somebody was just a little quirky or a little obsessive or a little anxious and they were okay with that and it didn't really ruin their life, then that's a trait. And if somebody said, this is a problem, it's messing up my life, I need some help, then it's a disorder. And that was really tidy, and that's what I was taught, and that's, that's what I believed. The problem with this idea is that when you study it, impairment itself is a dimensional construct. So people, for instance, in depression, people who are really, really depressed are really, really impaired. People who are not depressed at all are not impaired, but there are people who are slightly depressed who are a little impaired. So when we really drill down on what impairment is, we lose that ability to use it as a benchmark. The other benchmark that we had was this, this clause called a change from a usual state. 
so that you are a certain way, you have your own temperament and personality, and then something happens and you act differently. And there are certainly people where that's very, very true. There are people who are very happy people, and then depression comes on them and it's like they hit a brick wall. There is people who have classic bipolar disorder who really go up and down, and those people are out there. But for a lot of people, that isn't true. Uh, especially when it comes to things like ADHD, for autism, uh, it's really hard to say what is your usual state, what is your baseline. So that benchmark doesn't work. And when it comes to kids, it's even more complicated, especially the impairment one, because then the question is, impairment according to whom? You know, I'll see some kids who are very, very hyperactive. Are, do they consider themselves to have any kind of, no, they're, they're fine, right? I mean, it's, it's when you ask the teachers or when you ask the parents that this idea that there's impairment. So it gets to be even more complex. So these, these, uh, these benchmarks that we've wanted to rely on, unfortunately, just aren't as reliable as, as we thought. This is a, a summary slide um, that looks at, sort of, that sort of summarizes what we know about how different traits are related to different disorders. And I'm sorry for some of the, like ODD is oppositional defiant disorder, CD is conduct disorder. The darker the red, that means that that, that, trait, that trait has been associated with more of that disorder. So high extroversion and higher ADHD combined type. And blue means the opposite, so that if you have um, lower levels of regulatory ability, you have higher ADHD symptoms. Does that make sense for folks? I know it's kind of a busy slide. The take home from this slide is that I want to show you that it's not a simple kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between one trait and one disorder. It looks as though that there are some dimensions that seem to be relevant for psychiatric disorders, and it doesn't matter which one, and that's, that's especially this one. So, so people who are low in this regulatory ability, this ability to kind of regulate your attention, regulate your behavior, regulate your, your emotions, that seems to be low, and it doesn't matter which disorder that you talk about. And the, the, and the more people struggle with that, the more severe the psychopathology tends to be. Other disorders seem to have more to do with the direction of psychiatric illness, which type. So I would say extroversion is probably a great example. So ADHD, especially the hyperactive type, the combined type, often a combination of high extroversion, low regulatory control, whereas autism often seems to be associated with low extroversion and low regulatory ability, if you understand that. This is not to say that temperament is the end all and be all, that but it, these things have certainly been found to be strongly associated in the literature. Now, without getting too technical, maybe if people are interested in this, I can get into this a little bit more, but one of the reasons why we find so much overlap is when you actually look at the language to describe what a temperament trait is and what a disorder is, you find a lot of shared language. So, you know, there's a, there's a rating scale that people use to measure novelty seeking. And one of the items is, uh, gets into temper tantrums. And if, if a mom says yes for their kid, they get a point for novelty seeking. DSM, in the criteria for oppositional defiant disorder is, often has temper tantrums. So, one of the things that we struggle with is how much of this is sort of a real, you know, is, is a real thing versus just shared language. But I would argue if we have so much shared language between what we're calling a trait and what we're calling a disorder, not only do we have a method problem, we have a theory problem because we're using the same language to describe both domains. To add another layer of complexity onto this, it may not have to do with just the combination of temperament traits within a person, but within a family. And that goes back to the old Thomas and Chess model about goodness of fit. This was a study where we were looking at the relations between the trait of novelty seeking and the problem of attention problems in ADHD. And what we found is that kids would have the highest level of attention problems if they had a combination of both high novelty seeking kid plus a high novelty seeking mom. If you were a high novelty seeking kid but had a low novelty seeking mom, you didn't have elevated levels of attention problems. You needed the combination. And that was some verification for this idea uh, that what really matters is how well these traits fit within a particular environment. So we move from the question of if um, temperament and psychopathology are related to how. And um, 
One of the reasons why I like to do these, lo these longer lectures is it just doesn't fit into a five second sound bite for the news. And probably there are multiple mechanisms that are at play for different combinations of disorders and traits. And these are just a list of some of the, the models that are out there. So for some things, it really may be a continuum. I think for ADHD and activity level, a continuum model might be fairly appropriate. For other things, the continuum model doesn't really work. Uh, drug abuse might be one. I mean, personality traits are not the same thing as drug abuse, but they may be a risk factor for drug use. Um, there may be, there's something called a common factor model, which means that you start in the same place, but then there are these different ingredients that leave some people to have kind of trait levels of things and other people to have a disorder level. That may be true for anxiety. So you may take two kids both who are equally, have an equal tendency to become anxious, but then because of adverse events or some trauma or something, you know, one person then develops a full-blown uh, disorder while another person keeps lower levels of traits. Uh, there, may be, um, there may be something that's the opposite of the risk factor, that this was something called the SCAR model. So the SCAR model is not that traits are a risk factor for psychopathology, but psychopathology causes traits to change. And in, in Alzheimer's disease, there's pretty good evidence for that. So the plaques and tangles that can develop in the brain, those, well, some of the first signs of those are actually personality change. And nobody argues that the personality change is a risk factor for the Alzheimer's. It's actually a marker for the illness itself. And then there may be bidirectional models where everything is working and interacting with each other. And I think depression and some of the traits associated with depression might be a good example of that. One area that I'm really interested in right now is I, I hope I've made a compelling case that at least on the surface, it really looks like psychiatric symptoms live on a continuum. And it's really hard to find that I call speed limit to separate a disorder. But you can't assume that just because on the surface there's a continuum, that underneath there's a continuum, right? So the question that I think is really interesting right now, and we don't have enough data to answer it right now, is whether this applies at the level of the brain, on the level of genetics. In other words, are, are the factors that make somebody a little bit active, do you just have to turn those same factors up to get hyperactivity? Or is there actually something different, qualitatively different, about the people who meet criteria for ADHD? We don't know. And you can't assume that just because you have that distribution that it is the same. An example, if we measured everybody's, you know, if we measured the entire town's hematocrit, like your, your blood level, we would probably get a beautiful, normal distribution. But at the low end of that spectrum, the people who have that very low blood level, some of them may be bleeding, right? There might be a, a hole somewhere. And that is a very different mechanism than the people who are kind of in the middle. And it would be probably a good idea to know about that mechanism. And, that, and what we don't know right now is, is whether there are things in mental health that apply. People have studied it. This is a study, don't, don't worry, this is a complicated slide, but this was a study that tried to look at whether the same genes that loaded onto trait anxiety loaded onto anxiety disorders. And the answer was it was about half, 50-50. About half of the genes that loaded onto the trait were the same as the disorder, half were different. So based on your own temperament, if you're a half full or a half empty kind of person, you can say that's a lot of overlap or that's not a lot of overlap. So getting back to the idea that you know, we need to anchor this in neuroscience, I would just caution people when we throw these terms out there, you know, that, that, that we have a lot of terms, but there are terms, there are language. And we, even though we throw out these things, temperament, personality, anxiety disorders, personality disorders, organic conditions, all of this has to live in that same brain. We only have the one brain. We don't have the disorder part of your brain and the trait part of your brain. It's just the same brain. Okay. Doing okay. Go about another 10, 10 minutes and then we can break for questions. So now I'm just going to turn to so what? What are we going to do about it? How do we apply this? It's, it's interesting to think about. It's interesting to talk about. But why does it really matter? So I want to tell you about a little bit of how our clinic works in Vermont and how we're you know, a bit of an anomaly that way. Um, when we do evaluations, when we assess kids, actually we assess entire families, but when we assess kids, 
we use instruments that are not yes, no instruments. We use instruments that are quantitative and that are normed. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the child behavior checklist, which was developed at the University of Vermont. And you can see that it slices up behavioral problems in these eight different ways. And on each, and on each one, you get a score. And that score is normed relative to other people of the same age and sex. So for this kid, you know, you can say, well, your level of attention problems relative to other 10-year-old boys is at the 95th percentile. Is that ADHD? I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I can read through DSM-5 and I can see whether it fits or not, but I don't think that really gets to the heart of the question. So instead of sort of instead of rolling out and pointing fingers and saying, you, we, we tend not to say you have this. You know, you have this disorder, you have this disorder. We often just show them this and we say, you're at the 95th percentile. Is that a problem? It well could be a problem. Kids who are at the 95th percentile of attention problems could really be struggling, especially if there's other things going on. But rather than sort of saying, you know, Rather than using have, we talk about things being on a continuum, and this is where they are, and that with some help, we might be able to move them, that it's not destiny, that with time and with some effort, we may be able to move people on that line. And I, I actually think that this is a much less stigmatizing way to present this to kids, because it's not as you have this thing and all your friends don't. It's we're all on this spectrum, we're on different points of this spectrum, and here are some things that we can do to move you in one direction or another. Um, you know, because people often, you know, one of the questions I get a lot is, should you apply, are, are temperament labels any better than, than diagnosis labels? And uh, to me, it's not the label itself, but, but the meaning attributed behind it. We're all very good now, like, we don't say that kids are bad anymore, right? We, all, we learned that one, that we were told. We, we don't say you are bad, you say you're acting, you're acting badly. So I think we should do the same thing when it comes to the, some of these labels, rather than saying, you are shy, you know, you can say to a, a toddler who hides behind you, you're acting shy. You know, it's a subtle language difference, but I think, I think it's meaningful. Another thing, and this is, uh, or I think what, what we're trying to do fits in so well with, with some of the things I heard about the Stop ACEs program, is that we, we use a model called the Vermont Family-Based Approach, which was developed by our chief of child psychiatry, Jim Hojek. And essentially what the idea is, is that we expand the focus of child mental health evaluations to the entire family. And that we go beyond just looking at symptom checklists and not looking at just at illness, but looking at wellness measures as well and looking at health promotion models. So not only do we ask about whether you meet criteria for this criteria or that criteria, you know, if we're doing an ADHD evaluation, we wanna know, you know what time does the go to, does a child go to bed? How does the bedtime routine work? What does the child eat? Does the child get a good breakfast? Is the child spending eight hours a day playing Minecraft? You know, how much are they reading? Do the parents have their own psychiatric disorders that are impacting things? That we, if we can help the parents, we can be helping the kids. All of these things, uh, all of these things bring to bear on our evaluations. And I really feel like our field, you know, speaking again to the, the students, one of the things that I think is slowly turning is that we've, we've used the term mental health for decades, but we haven't really meant it. We've really been about mental illness. And one of the things that is slowly starting to change is that we're trying to teach our trainees and our students not just about what goes wrong and how things can go poorly, but what can go right. And that's a, that's a big frame shift. You can, be, you can be the world's expert in depression and know nothing about happiness. You know, you can be this expert in trauma and abuse and not know what are the good things to do as parents. And that's what we have to change. That's what we have to change our training programs to get people to think about the entire spectrum. And I'm really pleased that that's, that that's going on. Another thing is to bring in the entire family. And we heard Dr. Joseph talking about parenting. And parenting is such a critical piece. But one of the things that we found is you have to be able to do it you have to be able to deliver it in a way that sounds, uh, that does not sound blaming. Um, because psychiatry had this era, may, many of you know, where we blamed everything on parents, right? Autism was because you had a, you had a cold mom. And that wasn't a very proud era for us. 
Um, but the pendulum, I think, has swung too far to the other extreme, where parents have become almost irrelevant. Um, we'll, we'll just give you this. We'll just give the child this medicine, and, and things will get better. We need to sort of bring that. We bring that. We need to bring that back, and we have to. We have to deliver the message that parents are so critical, and that you can be a huge part of the solution without being part of, without having been part of the problem. One analogy I heard that I liked is, you know, just because you take aspirin and it helps your headache doesn't mean your headache was caused by a lack of aspirin. Um, that kind of works for me. Another analogy I like, and that's why I have this picture here, is, I, and you live near mountains, so you'll get this, is that kids like big mountains can create their own weather, right? So a kid who tends to be very whatever, very irritable, very anxious, they pull out of the environment specific components, right? And those components may not be optimal. And so we have to be able to think about that. So, uh, so it may be that you know, another analogy I like is about driving. We just got through winter. And I remember, you know, you, you see on the news and you see pictures of Atlanta. They get, what, one inch of snow and they're crippled, right? They can't go anywhere. And we kind of sit there and we go... What, what's up with these people? Can't they drive in one inch of snow? And we all feel pretty smug about our ability to drive through a foot of snow to get to work. But we have to remember that the roads are different and that if I were driving in Atlanta, I might have more trouble too. And that's the same concept with parenting. We have to be able to be very, I think we have to approach parenting from a very humble place. Not that we're the experts, you're doing something wrong and we need to fix you, but that this is really hard that if you have a kid with strong temperamental traits or, or behavioral problems, it's even harder. And if you have some of the same traits as your kid, which is the way genetics tends to work, it's really, really hard. So we're not trying to, we're not trying to fix deficient parents. We're trying to train super parents to be able to, to handle these, these difficulties. And I think that's a much better, a not, much better angle, and I found it to be much more palatable to families. I, used, I mean, I've sat. I consider myself to be a pretty decent parent, but I'm by far from perfect. And I've sat in lectures where you are and listened to parenting lectures, and I've been thinking, you know, the best way to help my own kids is to get that guy to adopt them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just not a really great place for change. So we have to be, that we ha I think we have to come to this place with some humility and some humor and be able to recognize that what might be getting pulled out of parents is very natural, but it may not be optimal. It may be reinforcing those, those temperamental traits and making them stronger. So we talk about the override. You know, what is, what is this irritable child pulling out of you, and what can you do to override what might be this very natural response? So kind of putting all that together, you know, we've had this era, we've got a parent and a child. We've used to think about things, you know, the era where we talked about everything was due to the parents, we used to say, well, you're parenting in a suboptimal way and that's having this effect on your kid. And then there was the era of psychopharmacology, and we said, hey, it's all about genes. The genes are loading onto the child, let's use a medicine, treat the irritability in the child. But the way it probably works is that those irritability genes, remember, also may be loading onto the parent, and the child's irritability may be loading, may be causing the parents to become more angry and it recycles back. And when you put all of this together, you get family conflict. And in many cases, that's our patient. That's what we're treating. And we're not saying it's a bad kid. We're not saying it's a bad parent. We're saying when something happens, when all of you are in the room together, let's understand how these cycles develop and let's figure out ways that we can intervene to make this cycle work in the other direction. So that, that was it. I think the main points that I want to I wanna make is that uh, temperament and psychiatric disorders are inextricably linked. Um, for many things, the difference between a trait and a disorder really may be one of degree, uh, where in other circumstances uh, it may be more complicated than that. Uh, but that using this knowledge Using this, per per this perspective is far from an academic exercise and really can fundamentally change the way we think about psychiatric illness and the way that we talk about and address behavioral challenges, at whether you're a parent or a teacher 
or a clinician or a therapist. So thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. We don't, we don't use it. We don't have people who are trained in it. I know there are some people in uh, Burlington who have been trained in it. Um, I don't follow the literature. My understanding is that the literature just got a little better, that for a long time a lot of people were using it, but the evidence that really shows that it works in a, in a randomized way was okay, but that it's recently gotten a little better. Yes, ma'am. The, the way the norms were developed was a, was, a, was a national sample, yeah. And I, and I should point out that not only do we have, and we have like the mom rate the kid, the dad rate the kid, the kid rate the kid, the teachers rate the kid, it can be a lot of forms. But to make it even worse, we have mom rate mom, mom rate dad, dad rate dad, dad rate mom. And we show them all of that. Because uh, it's often hard to argue with yourself. You know, someone says, I'm not irritable, and you say, well, you yourself just rated yourself in the 98th percentile on irritability. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yes. Yeah, the Pazawa study, yeah. Yeah, great spot. Um, let me get back there. So what you're noticing is the, uh, the LL genotype, and I just didn't want it to get too complicated, but basically whether or not you were in one pattern or the other was predicted by your status, your allele of the serotonin transporter gene, which is a gene that's been receiving a lot of attention, maybe too much attention. But in this, in this study, if you had one particular allele, you were more likely to have less feedback between the two areas. If you had the other allele, there was a lot more intercommunication. No, I would, you know, we spent a lot of time, there was an era in psychiatry where we were looking for the gene for things. You know, we were trying to find that gene for bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Those efforts really failed. And even though, um, there are genes that are linked. They explain a very, very tiny piece of this picture, even things like the serotonin transporter. So most of the things that we deal with are probably related to dozens, if not hundreds of genes that may be interacting with each other. So I, I would caution anyone to get too hyped up about a particular gene. This is not cystic fibrosis that we're dealing with here. Yes. Yeah, so the question is what, you know, what other things can fit? Um, yeah, so you asked about, so bipolar disorder, I don't, it could be a, that could be a whole other talk. Classic bipolar disorder, maybe not. But what's happened in the last um, 20 years is that the bipolar diagnosis has been applied to kids who are chronically irritable and explosive, essentially. And for those folks, that, that really does look like a dementia. And when it comes to schizophrenia or psychosis, we were talking about this at lunch, um, psychosis is sort of defined, to, uh, there's, like, there's positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Positive things are like um, delusions and hallucinations. That may actually be a little bit more binary. It's, it's kind of tough to sort of have a hallucination. But there is a negative, what are called negative symptoms of schizophrenia, kind of the, the lack of affect, uh, some social withdrawal, those things definitely do seem to look like on a continuum. I would say most things that we deal with, especially in child, probably live on a continuum. The personality disorders, I think, are, are, are a perfect example of things that are on a continuum. Um, 
you have borderline personality disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, obsessive compulsive personality, uh, a lot of these things. Personality disorders are sort of in this in-between area, between, they're like right in between the trait and disorders. Yes? How do you tease out genetics and environments? Well, ten so I think you mean how do you tease out what's genetic? Because temperament is a combination of genetics and environment. And the way you tease it out, yes, but predispositions can also be related to the environment. That's, and that's one of the myths, I think, about temperament, is that it looks like temperament is, is caused by the environment more than we had thought. And the way you actually do these calculations without getting too, too uh, technical is you do twins, most of them are done using twin studies. And you look at how much alike uh, uh, monozygotic twins are, identical twins versus uh, fraternal twins. And you put that through some statistical modeling and you can get your, your uh, numbers. Did you have a question? For Yeah. So the question is about what about there are families where you, it really seems like they really want a label. And I think that's because a lot of families really feel like the label sort of gives some identity. It's sort of, you can close the book on what this is, now we can move on what to do about it. And, and sometimes that's true, sometimes that's not true. Sometimes the label gets you something really concrete. So you know, if you say my kid meets criteria for autistic spectrum disorder, I get all these services at school. If you say he's just below, I don't get any. And I think part of that has to do, we have to, do, we have to be a better at doing dimensional treatment. Right now, it seems like we have binary treatment. Um, but if that's the case, you know, I'll sometimes, I'll, sometimes I'll bend things around a little bit if I feel like you know, this person would really benefit from some services, and we need that label to get it. Yes, in the back. I'm sorry, I missed what the processing? I, I haven't looked at that specifically. Um, I mean, that, that, that element about sort of hypersensitivities to different sense, that comes up a lot, especially uh, along the autistic spectrum. Um, but, but no, it hasn't been a, an emphasis for myself, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So the, the message that we that we have to we really have to be paying attention to the stigma and how, how our language affects kids, I, I think is thank you for your comment. I appreciate that. Yes, in the back. Yes, so absolutely. That's a question is, does the, you know, the effect of temperament go beyond parents? And absolutely it does. And I think you know, the temperament of teachers can really make a huge difference. I mean, I have kids who, you know, I, they'd, they'd have this awesome year, then they'd have this horrible year, then they'd have another awesome year, and I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I think that has to do with that fit. 
you know, sometimes between the teacher and the parent, and certainly with peers as well. And one of the things about temperament is that, you know, you choose, you, you're based on your temperament, you tend to choose your friends based on temperament. And that's another way that you can reinforce so those initial qualities. So, you know, people who really like a lot of adrenaline and like to do a lot of things, guess who they hang out with? They hang out with other people like that, and then they egg each other on, and then they're jumping out of airplanes, right? <laughs> All right, well, thank you for your attention. Hope some of you will stick around for the book signing. Parents are so 